In the late 1970s, Lisa Kretz Thomas was a young professional living in Washington, D.C. She eagerly embraced the liberated lifestyle and it's laid out in this book, Light in Our Darkness, of how she went absolutely into degradation. Well, she's here with us right now, but first, let's look at this. Lisa Kratz Thomas spent her younger years fighting a drug addiction. She turned to prostitution to support her addiction and spent time behind bars. I walked into that jail feeling like discarded trash, but I walked out feeling like possibly I could change my life. Today, Lisa helps formerly incarcerated women who are trying to reclaim their lives. In her new book, Light in Our Darkness, she shares how she finally found freedom, both from jail and the destructive lifestyle that kept her in prison for years. Well, welcome to the 700 Club, Lisa Kratz Thomas. Lisa, it's good to have you with us. I am so happy to be here, Pat. You, you don't even know. I'm just so <laughs> ecstatic. Well, you know, I read your book, and I see you sitting here, and I cannot believe that the woman who's sitting here is the one who was portrayed in that book. It's an incredible transformation. Yeah, Jesus can really clean you up good. You know, it's, yeah. um, could never imagine 25 years ago when I was living on the streets of D.C., when I was sleeping in Lafayette Park, yeah. when I was addicted to cocaine, that I would end up on the 700 Club yeah. with Pat Robertson. Lisa, what were you trained as? You were a, quote, young professional. What, what, what were you trained to do? Well, I graduated from an all-girls Catholic high school and got a job with the Department of Justice. Yeah. How ironic is that? Um, as a secretary. So I had a, a great secretarial career. Well, I read your book, you know, I, I'm familiar with the scene in Washington, and just, mm -hmm. just some of us have before we came to the Lord. Uh, but you, your book was as if every time you had a date and wanted for dinner, you were supposed to have sex with a guy. I mean, was it, was it that way? I mean, you were liberated because of the pill. Exactly. Well, my philosophy was I would have sex with you first and then decide if I was going to date you. Seriously, that oh, is... Come on, are you no? serious? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's how I was living my life. Um, I bought into every single lie that was peddled by the uh, women's movement at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, the whole idea is that you're going to now be liberated. You got this pill. You can, you're not going to get pregnant. And you can just live it up and, and, and engage in any kind of kinky activity. Mm -hmm. Did you go for all this kink and that kind of stuff? You know what? I did whatever I had to do to escape the walls that I had built in my own mind, Pat. Yeah. There was so much pain. There was, I, I felt so bad about myself that whatever I thought would allow me that escape, mm -hmm. I would take advantage of it and I would try it. Well, somewhere along the way, um, you had multiple sex partners and um, then you got with a guy who became your pimp. Was he selling you drugs? He got you hooked on crack? Well, you know, it, 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 it never is that clean cut. Yeah. You know, we were, we dated and, and for a long time, and then we both got addicted to crack. And when you get to a point where you can't go to work, you can't make money any other way, you do whatever you have to do. And so he was my boyfriend turned pimp later in our relationship. Yeah. So you, you would go out and have two or three tricks a night in order to get the money to pay for the crack. Is that That's right. Lisa, what does it feel like? I mean, you're, you're in a Catholic high school. <laughs> you, you're, you're a nice young girl. You've got a nice job with the Justice Department mm -hmm. of all places. And uh, yet you're out selling yourself. What does it feel like? You've got some stranger coming in and you're going to give mm -hmm. your body to him. How, how does that feel? I mean, I, I can't conceive of it. Well, you know, it, it starts in your mind. It's, yeah. it's, um, I can look back to when I was five years old. Satan started to weave this web in me that you're no good. You're a bad little girl. Mm. Uh, and the world would be better off if you weren't here. And when you get those thoughts into your mind and there's nothing to dispel those, that becomes part of who you are, the fabric of who you are. Uh -huh. So I, I didn't think of it that way. I just felt like this is my life and this is what what a person like me does. And it, it evolved into not being able to get up and go to work and take a shower because the drugs took over. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
you know, it, it's, it's one of those things where you shut part of yourself down to be able to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's always times in the day that you can't shut that down. When the drugs are gone, when the people are gone, when the light of day comes up yeah. and you're faced with the reality of what you've done and what your life is, the shame and the guilt and the pain is so overwhelming, that's when you start moving into those suicidal thoughts to say, hey, I'd be better off if I wasn't here. Well, along the way, you got pregnant. Several times you got pregnant. You, you had abortion. What did you think about abortion? We, your book has some word about Dr. Nathanson and what he did, but uh, uh, were you fed the life? It's, it's my body and I can do what I want to with it? Well, absolutely, and, and that's exactly what it was, a lie that was fabricated by a bunch of men sitting around the table and said, hey, let's push this concept, it's a woman's right to choose. That's mm -hmm. what NARAL did, and I bought that lie because I was under the assumption that it was a mass of cells, that it wasn't a human being, that it was just something that you could go in and get rid of. And it was, the, the, you know, it's so amazing because all the things that I'd been through in my life, God healed me. I started walking in sobriety. I started walking with the Lord. But that one part of me, Pat, mm -hmm. those abortions kept me in such bondage to shame for such a long time because, mm -hmm. you know, you only know what you know at the time. Yeah. But when you find out what you've done, oh, it just, you know, I just, I, I can remember just crying out to the Lord and saying, Lord, you've healed me from everything. Mm -hmm. Please, Lord, take this. I'm so sorry for what I've done. It kept me locked into that shame. And, you know, if there's anybody that's listening, I just have to say, Jesus can heal you everywhere you hurt. Yeah. And I am yeah. living proof <laughs> of that. Well, did you, did that bring you out of the lifestyle? I mean, you wound up in prison because it was possession or, or, or selling or, or... Writing bad checks to support my Oh, habit. you're right. Oh, right oh, yeah. bad, you got your bad checks. Oh, yeah. So there wasn't any crime that you weren't capable of committing. Oh, no. I was, I was very crafty. I, I could do whatever I had to do. I was a professional liar. Um, I could make you believe anything that I needed you to believe so I could get high. Well, you were actually a slave to this stuff, weren't you? Absolutely. I mean, you had, that was more important than anything in life, was getting a, another fix. That's it. It was that way. It was that way. And um, nothing, I, not my family, not my health, not my safety. I mean, I've had guns drawn on me. I've, had, I've been in, in, you know, uh, situations with gangs. Nothing mattered to me except getting the drug because it's a vicious cycle. You start, you escape, then the reality comes back. And the only way that you can make that go away is to do the, the very were, thing that got you, you there. Beaten in those situations? Oh yeah. Many yeah. times? Many times. Um, my, my boyfriend, my pimp, uh, broken nose, broken arms, broken ribs, um, thrown down steps, thrown out of cars. Um, and I was just like, hey, uh, that's okay. If this is the price I have to pay, then it's just the price I have to pay. Unbelievable. Now, this started when you were five years old. I mean, this self-image thing. Yes, it did. And you just felt you were worthless. I did. I really felt like God made good people and bad people. Yeah. And I just happened to be one of the bad people. And that he kind of liked me, but he wasn't really there <laughs> for me. Yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. It's terrible. All right. You... Wound up. How did you finally make the decision to get out of this bondage? Because this this pip had you in bondage. You you kept going back to him, even though he beat you up and mm -hmm. he, and stole your money and everything else. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> what really helped me was incarceration, believe yeah. it or not, because it took me off the streets and it gave me enough time to have clarity in my mm -hmm. spirit and in my mind. And um, when I got out, I, you would think when I walked out of the jail that I would have walked into recovery or the church or something, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I went back with, with him. And we ended up in the crack house and probably two hours after I was released from incarceration. And about five minutes after that, I was getting my head beat in. And I left, I walked out and I went and I sat on the curb. I, I'm telling you, this is like yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I looked up and I said, if you're up there, you either change me or you take me because I cannot live like this anymore. Yeah. 
What was wrong with this guy? How come he wanted to beat you up? What was, what was, was he psychotic or what was wrong with him? Well, you know, drugs and crack cocaine, that does some weird things to your thinking, and it brings on a, a, a paranoia, and it was severe in him. Mm -hmm. And he always thought that there were really people chasing us, people in the house, and that I was part of the, that conspiracy. Oh, man. So, um, and I knew every time we'd get high, he'd do it. But trust me, it didn't stop me. How often were you in the hospital? Uh, a few times, but I, I didn't have the money, uh, the resources, uh, and I certainly didn't want, I was afraid of authority in any way, shape, or form, so I kind of mm -hmm. stayed away from that. Well, you made that decision, I'm coming out of here. He was beating your head against the wall, mm -hmm. and you said, I'm not going to take this anymore, and you cried out to God. What happened? Well, I wish I could say everything went well from then, but it didn't. Yeah. But shortly after that, I got involved in 12-step, and I was introduced to... Uh, the concept of a God that was loving. Mm -hmm. And I was given a set of tapes by a popular TV evangelist, Grace, Grace, and More Grace. Mm -hmm. And I popped those tapes in, and I heard that the Lord loves you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. He loves you. And he would have died if you were the only person on the face of this earth. Mm -hmm. And you knew the Holy Spirit was there because I'd heard that many times. I mean, there were people always coming to the rehabs and the jail telling me yeah. God loved me. And I was like, well, he may love you, honey, but he doesn't love me, okay? <laughs> yeah. And so, but I heard it that day. And there was this sense of relief. Mm -hmm. There was this sense that, oh my gosh, it's you know, maybe he really does love me. Yeah. And that was it. And that was it. What, how simplistic for such a complex situation. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> well, you went from there. I mean, you're out teaching and preaching and leading <laughs> other people to the Lord. It's just an amazing transformation. How long did it take to get you cleaned up? And, and It didn't take long. I really? mean, really. You know, I, I started mentoring women inside the rooms of 12-step probably a, a, a year after I was sober and um, then really got connected with my church and started a women's ministry. And, um, you know, I've always loved to do things big. I always yeah. like to do things that are exciting. And so um, God put that in me. Mm -hmm. I, I used that for the wrong things. My motives were wrong. But when I aligned back with his will, mm -hmm. things started to happen in a huge way. The thing about it is so interesting, there's no shame. I mean, the, the Lord has taken that shame away, and, 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 and you're clean, and you're a whole new, new creature. That's what, that's what the Bible says, isn't it? He does. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. When creation. you're in Him, a, when you're in yeah. Him. <laughs> you're a new creation. I'm new. I'm new. I'm not ashamed of that. I'm not embarrassed by that. Because the Lord took me from the pits of hell mm -hmm. and, and, and took me really to the throne room. And why I need to share that with other people. He didn't do that. We're only as sick as our secrets. Yeah. So we've got to be able to share those things to help other people Listen, to walk with Him. You're tremendous. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the time we've got. But do you want to read this book? It's fantastic. Light in Our Darkness. And there are three people involved in this book, not just Lisa, but a couple of others. You want to read it. And it's available wherever books are sold. So it's all the time we've got. Lisa, you're terrific. God bless Thank you, darling. Thank you, Pat. God bless you.